Bonsoir tout le monde. Merci, merci d'être venu ici ce soir à l'Institut Franco-Américain. Je suis Anthony Larson, je suis membre du conseil d'administration, la, la présidente de l'Institut, uh, Virginia Manhard de Lubin, uh, vous présente ses excuses. Elle ne peut pas être uh, avec nous ce soir pour, uh, pour cette conférence, mais évidemment, elle vous souhaite uh, la bienvenue uh, uh, à l'Institut ce soir pour la, la continuation de, nos, de notre cycle de conférences uh, ce mois-ci. C'est un mois chargé en activité. Uh, nous avons uh, encore cette semaine, avec la, la visite de la délégation de la ville de Rochester, uh, une conférence uh, jeudi soir à 18h30, uh, comme d'habitude, avec, uh, avec une collègue universitaire de, de Paris 10, uh, Nanterre, uh, Aurélienne Narvez, qui viendra parler de, de mouvements de, de, de réformes religieuses dans l'État de New York pendant le 19e siècle. Uh, pendant la période de, de, de grandes réformes religieuses euh, aux États-Unis pendant, pendant cette période. Euh, la fin de la semaine aussi sur, euh, sera euh, un moment euh, important pour l'Institut pour concernant l'inauguration d'un euh, parcours des, des artistes américains et nord-américains au Musée de Beaux-Arts, qui est juste à côté, qui est, euh, qui est le fruit d'un projet qui était mené par un partenariat avec des étudiants de, de l'Université euh, Rennes II l'Institut et le Musée des Beaux-Arts. Alors, l'inauguration de ce parcours aura lieu à partir de 18h30 et, et ensuite est, euh, est à votre disposition euh, gratuitement hein, dans la politique de, de, du musée pendant euh, toute l'année euh, et euh, toutes les années à venir également. Et évidemment, le mois d'octobre est aussi pour euh, les lycéens et les collégiens, c'est le, le mois des vacances, c'est aussi la Toussaint, mais c'est aussi Halloween. Et donc, euh, Halloween sera fêté ici à l'Institut avec, euh, avec des enfants, notamment euh, des enfants qui sont, euh, qui sont déjà dans les clubs euh, à, à, avec l'Institut et aussi sur inscription. Le mercredi 25 octobre, donc c'est pendant les vacances, et je crois que Hillary m'a dit qu'il reste quelques places encore. Peut-être, Hillary, <rire> pour la fête de Halloween, il reste encore quelques places ou pas Voilà, les, les petits-enfants ou des grands-enfants ici présents, hein, si vous voulez fêter Halloween aussi à la fin du mois. Ce soir, nous, nous accueillons donc euh, euh, en partenariat avec euh, l'Institut des Amériques, qui est une structure qui, qui fédère des universités en France euh, euh, concernant les études euh, sur euh, les Amériques dans, dans le sens euh, pluriel, donc Amérique du Sud, Amérique latine et Amérique du Nord. Euh, un, une, une personne qui, qui, qui est ici avec nous sur euh, une, une une structure de, 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 de chair des Amériques, euh, c'est Ted Ownby, euh, euh, notre invité qui est, qui est à l'Université Rennes 2 pendant un mois, qui intervient sur la question de l'histoire du Sud des États-Unis, l'histoire des États-Unis en général. Ted est fraîchement à, à la retraite, sauf qu'il euh, nous a rappelé qu'il travaille toujours avec des étudiants de, qui sont dans des études avancées. Euh, tu es retraité de... La notation. Hein? You're, you're retired from marking papers. <laughs> Qui est une très bonne chose. Um, spécialiste de l'histoire du Sud, historien. Ted est aussi l'ancien directeur d'un grand centre sur uh, le, le, le Sud, sa culture, son histoire. Uh, sa production uh, culturelle uh, uh, qui s'appelle le Center for the Study of Southern Culture qui est à l'Université de Mississippi, à Oxford, Mississippi. Uh, C'est uh, une université en partenariat avec Rennes 2. Ted, avec son expertise, interviendra ce soir sur uh, les, les questions du Sud et notamment uh, la question du mouvement des, des droits civiques et uh, des questions de vocabulaire. Uh, le, le titre de sa présentation, c'est Brotherhood and Brotherhoodism in the Civil Rights Era South. Ted interviendra, uh, comme indiqué sur le programme, en anglais. Ted? Merci pour l'invitation. Uh, merci, uh, Institut uh, Hillary uh, et mes amis uh, uh, à l'Université de Rennes 2. Uh, Thank you for coming. Um, um, I wish I could speak in French. I wish I could lecture in French. I cannot. Um, and uh, possibly by the time I, I leave, about three months, about three weeks from now, um, my French will be so much better that I could get, that I could lecture en français as I leave. But certainly uh, not tonight. The uh, um, 
the uh, uh, I'm enjoying my um, my time at, in uh, Huyen. Uh, it's uh, a number of people ask, "What are you going to do when you retire?" And and being able to say, "I'm going to Huyen to give uh, lectures and meet new colleagues," was was not the answer that uh, that my friends uh, expected. Um, the uh, um, tonight. Uh, I, I will talk about language, uh, about uh, words, uh, especially the word brotherhood uh, and brotherhoodism. Uh, that that uh, um, my friend Professor Larson mentioned in the, in the the title. Um, the this this comes from a book that came out four or five years ago um, on arguing about. Uh, issues of family life in the American South, uh, primarily in the 20th century. And uh, uh, I begin with a, a great work by Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, in 1963 from a letter uh, from Birmingham Jail. It was published in 1964. Uh, that's the letter, as so many of you uh, uh, know, a letter he wrote from prison um, uh, to the Christian ministers and one rabbi who had urged him to slow down, uh, to work within the system, uh, not to challenge um, uh, the uh, Birmingham race relations and government enough that it would make them hard uh, to um, uh, to move in the slow moving ways that they were wanting to, um, to that they were trying to do. Um, the, uh, uh, the, cri the criticisms, um, criticized him for being an outsider, criticized him from, for going too fast, criticized him for going too far. Um, Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter is famous for uh, the circumstances, you know, riding from jail, um, w riding on pieces of paper and giving it that guests brought him and kind of sneaking it out paper by page by page to, uh, um, to a publisher. Uh, also for phrases, I am here because injustice is here. Uh, for his discussion of civil dis disobedience, and I think most prominently uh, for his rejection of patience that uh, uh, his critics had called on him to to work slowly and that they would work more more effectively if, if uh, and he said that uh, um, that African Americans had uh, dealt with uh, with so much injustice for so many years that uh, being encouraged to work slowly through through the system was uh, uh, was an insult was not was not possible um, it's become commonplace I think in the United States in the past generation or so uh, to criticize one popular understanding or misunderstanding of uh, Martin Luther King jr. in history it's become commonplace for people on the left including the not very far left uh, to worry that Martin Luther King jr. has become uh, too easy to appreciate uh, if people only concentrate on a few optimistic uh, remarks about uh, I have a dream today rooted in the American dream or uh, the arc of history bends toward justice or uh, uh, want uh, to concentrate on the, the, the character of people rather than the color of their skin. Uh, so Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, has been uh, celebrated by the left and the right um, that criticism, I'd say, is all true. Uh, I'd say too far, uh, but the critique itself has become kind of commonplace too, that every February we hear people on the left criticizing people on the right for getting Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, wrong. So ultimately, uh, it seems like we have at least two Martin Luther King Juniors uh, to celebrate, one um, uh, talking optimistically about American progress, uh, one uh, who's much more of a, of a radical uh, talking about structural um, inequities about economics, and housing, violence, history of genocide and slavery, uh, and, and contemporary global politics. I'm making one very, very small contribution uh, tonight. I hope not too small to, to, to waste your time uh, for uh, a, a, a few minutes to talk about this concept of brotherhood, which was so crucial in um, Martin, Luther, Martin Luther King Jr.'s writing and speaking, and so crucial uh, to a lot of different uh, figures in the civil rights movement, especially in the South, uh, so crucial to the religious language of so many activists uh, in um, uh, the civil rights movement. And I'll talk fairly briefly, but also part of what made me interested in this topic was um, 
when the critics of Martin Luther King Jr. and the critics of and opponents of the civil rights movement um, attacked the concept of brotherhood with an alternative concept that they called uh, brotherhoodism. And um, uh, that's actually one of the moments doing the research when I saw that this is worth imp that this is important enough to study when it was important enough for people uh, for opponents uh, to attack um, the t the topic of brotherhood may very well strike you as bland optimistic not worth not very specific enough to 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 help solve problems uh, it will very likely um, strike some of you as, as all male, um, and uh, that's how it struck me too. Um, and I, I, um, it, it took a while for me to, to, to believe that what I'm doing this evening is, is worth the effort, that is, uh, uh, to get inside and see what people um, meant by the concept. Sometimes they said brotherhood and sisterhood. Most of the time they did. Most of the time that I'm studying, maybe 90% of the time, brotherhood stood for um, the, uh, the entire concept. Martin Luther King Jr., in that letter from Birmingham Jail, he used the words brotherhood or brothers and sisters 16 times in a short letter. And again, that's part of why it's worth studying is that he comes back to it. It was the last word in the letter, yours, for the cause of peace and brotherhood. Um, to me, it's intriguing. He used it in at least three ways, maybe four or five, but at least three. Uh, first, he criticized those moderate clergy that, that, uh, who had criticized him. He called them my Christian and Jewish brothers, um, you know, to be on their side and then to criticize. He, he criticized them for uh, equivocating and compromising and um, not thinking from a religious point of view about uh, issues of civil rights and protest, uh, but thinking about practical politics and school funding and um, who likes them and who doesn't. Uh, he said he wanted to see clergy supporting racial, deseg racial desegregation, quote, because it is morally right and because the Negro is your brother. Um, the, one of the most basic uses of the, the terms of human interconnectedness and uh, shared humanity. Uh, second, he described, uh, quote, my black brothers in Africa and my brown and yellow brothers in Asia. Uh, so it was a challenge and then it was a way to identify with, um, with um, the world's people uh, facing um, uh, particular forms of oppression. Uh, and finally, brotherhood was a possibility. He said that maybe the day, the hope the day will come without racial prejudice and hatred and misunderstanding when, quote, the, this is right at the end, uh, the radiant stars of love and brotherhood will shine over a great nation with all their scintillating beauty. So it was a challenge. Uh, it was a, a identification. Uh, and then it was a, a set of possibilities. Um, throughout most of his career, maybe all of his career, uh, when he gave sermons especially and gave lectures, um, Brotherhood was almost always there, um, um, sometimes a little, sometimes a lot. Um, it's of, often connected to the concept of the world house, the idea that all human beings are interconnected through uh, global politics and economics and occasionally climate uh, issues. Um, the uh, and world house had brother and sisterhood connotations. Um, brothers are, are brother and sisters are there in the I Have a Dream speech, the most uh, uh, frequently uh, uh, quoted part of his work. Um, those of you who hang out with historians know what comes next. Uh, several words of context. Uh, feel free to check your mail for a moment while I, but uh, um, the, uh, um, in America in the early 1800s, early 1900s, um, to the early 1900s, brotherhood was not as central as crucial a term for uh, issue, discussing issues of race as it became in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. Um, abolitionists certainly used it um, occasionally. Uh, Frederick Douglass, I know there's the Frederick Douglass uh, connection to, uh, to here in Wren, uh, used, um, talked about brotherhood, um, quoting Douglass, a smile or a tear has no nationality joy and sorrow spread alike to all nations they, uh, and they above all the confusion of tongues and languages proclaim the brotherhood of man um, Quakers used talked about brotherhood and sisterhood um, 
the, uh, um, uh, the demand for the right to vote, frequently discussed brotherhood and, and sisterhood increasingly. Um, for the most part, though, the, the topics, of brother, the, the words, brotherhood and sisterhood, um, uh, meant either you know, literal um, biological families, or they meant interest groups, male interest groups, lodges, fraternities, sororities, um, political parties, uh, uh, labor unions, um, um, church groups uh, were brotherhoods or they were sisterhoods. Um, it was not a crucial term in um, talking, thinking, writing about issues of race. In the early 1900s, the, uh, uh, the most prominent civil rights group in the U.S., the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP, didn't have a lot of people who talked about brotherhood. It was a lawyer's group, and they, their language was rights and the U.S. Constitution and justice through uh, processes, uh, and not so much this higher, um, more religious language of brotherhood and sisterhood. In the 1920s and 1930s, um, the uh, uh, clearest evidence of using this concept of brotherhood to think about race was probably in uh, a fairly small, uh, geographically uh, distributed um, uh, practice called uh, Brotherhood Sundays, or sometimes Brotherhood Week, uh, sometimes Brotherhood Sunday and Race Relations Week, in which churches, white and black churches, shared uh, or traded a minister or a choir or an event um, um, that uh, would happen once a week, or excuse me, one, one week a year would be Brotherhood Week or Brotherhood Sunday. Um, it, uh, um, it received um, um, criticism at the time, uh, and it also received lots of, lots, of, lots of instructions to be very careful. Um, uh, from both white and black ministers saying uh, uh, our, our goal in Brotherhood Week should, uh, should be to, to learn and show um, kindness and openness um, and a lot of care about either being uh, patronizing or being political. Um, I'll admit that when I've talked about this topic to uh, older American audiences that there's usually somebody who remembers Brotherhood Week or Race Relations Week and they remember it as a, a small moment in the history uh, and, a, and maybe even a forgotten uh, moment. Um, I found one um, critic of Brotherhood Sunday, uh, a minister of a large African-American church in Nashville, Tennessee, Kelly Miller Smith, uh, who wrote an essay, excuse me, a sermon called The Relevance of the Ridiculous, uh, where he said, uh, how can it possibly me be meaningful to have Brotherhood Week um, to share services with, um, with church people who practice racial segregation every other week and in every other institution um, of, of their lives? The, uh, somehow, that changed in the 1940s and 1950s. Um, uh, the large changes, uh, the global issues and global, uh, the global issues involved in World War II, the, um, the, the coming extraordinary challenge of the Brown versus Board of Education decision in 1954, which was, didn't just happen in 1954, but was a series of lawsuits and series of discussions with a lot of optimism on one side and fear on the other. Um, and um, brotherhood, and sometimes brotherhood and sisterhood um, uh, became a religious language to that a lot of uh, a lot of people that I'm studying, a lot of activists in the American South used uh, to respond, especially to uh, the issue of, of school desegregation, then travel desegregation, uh, eventually um, um, overturning. Uh, voter discrimination uh, as well. So brotherhood became a religious language uh, relevant and supported by and, and immediately understandable uh, to um, a lot of southern black and white um, uh, activists. Uh, just a couple of short examples and then some slightly longer examples. Um, in the, uh, the book where I wrote about this, I realized I would just do it until my press told me to stop and I just used the word brotherhood in every, like in every other sentence over and over and over. And I was just trying to prove it was important by, by quoting. And yeah, the press caught me and said, 
that's enough, Ted. Let's 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 talk about ideas and not just uh, and not just uh, um, uh, quote the word over and over. But some particularly vivid examples: 1942, the Congress of Racial Equality, uh, uh, one of many civil rights organizations, uh, started in Chicago. It started with the goal of desegregating uh, buses and other transportation. Uh, its first project was called the Brotherhood Mobilization Project. Um, in 1952, the Congress of Racial Equality had a campaign to desegregate institutions in Washington, D.C. You can imagine why Washington, D.C. was important. It's the national capital. Uh, it's also kind of on the border between South and North, um, and it, pra it had lots and lots of uh, segregated uh, institutions. The uh, uh, when the Congress of Racial Equality said, let us desegregate one by one and more by more institutions in Washington, D.C., it called, it called the, the effort the Pledge Brotherhood Campaign, and people had them take a specific pledge that they would practice brotherhood in all parts of their lives. Um, in uh, 1955, the first direct action effort uh, in the civil rights movement, or the first large sustained uh, direct action effort after the Brown versus Board of Education decision in 1954 was uh, at, at, at the moment when Martin Luther King Jr. became a public figure. He was the minister of the largest downtown church uh, in Montgomery. Uh, church members wrote a new song. I don't know who wrote it, but the song said, but while people were avoiding the buses, while African Americans were avoiding the buses for several months and walking or sharing rides, uh, they had a song. We know love is the watchword for peace and liberty. Black and white, all men are brothers to live in harmony. The uh, What I want to do for a few minutes is now to offer a few descriptions, short descriptions, of individuals in the American South, all of them supporters of the civil rights movement in one way or another, right in the middle of things or from the background, and how they used concept of brotherhood, and for some of them, brotherhood and sisterhood, and for most of them, uh, not. And um, with your permission, I'm not going to describe them as black or white individuals because uh, for a lot of them, brotherhood was central to uh, overturning the idea of race, to deconstructing and making irrelevant uh, the concept of race. So I'll just talk about these individuals and how they used uh, the terms. One, in Florida, Mary McLeod Bethune. She worked for decades on interracial committees, on anti-lynching movements, on uh, um, America's first or second leading figure in uh, African-American education, um, the uh, especially education for black women. Um, she was a longtime veteran uh, activist and organizer uh, by the 1940s and 50s. But between the end of World War II and uh, her death in the mid-1950s, uh, she never, like Martin Luther King Jr., she never spoke or wrote without discussing brotherhood. Frequently, she talked about world brotherhood. Uh, often at the end of her lectures, often very soaring and idealistic, uh, in 1954, uh, she gave a lecture at the Brotherhood Lunch of the National Council of Negro Women, a group she had helped form. Uh, she urged younger women to um, carry on their work until the spirit of brotherhood shall have in until the spirit of brotherhood shall have enveloped the world, and mankind everywhere will understand the change of heart and mind, the doing away with walls, the doing away with things intended to keep us apart. Uh, the next year, she wrote a public last will and testament. She knew she was uh, in her final um, years. Um, and what she left people in her last will and testament, uh, left people uh, with the search for peace and brotherhood. That's, her, that's the last, you know, why do I leave this and this and this? I leave you uh, uh, the search for peace and, and, and brotherhood. The, uh, um, that's in Florida. In Georgia, Clarence Jordan, uh, Baptist minister, uh, with some colleagues in the 1940s, he started a, uh, an interracial religious uh, farm community called Koinonia um, in rural Georgia um, to, to share the principles of Christian brotherhood, he said, with the um, positive experiences of farm life. Um, the, uh, he faced years of, Jordan did, of opposition 
of financial harassment, occasional violence. Uh, he said that um, Koinonia was practicing, quote, brotherhood in a powder keg situation. And if, if you don't know the story of Koinonia, um, um, you might know that it's the, it's the background for the formation of Habitat for Humanity, the, the, um, the, the building uh, organization um, most clearly associated with Jimmy Carter and Rosalind Carter. Um, also in Georgia, a friend of Jordan's, uh, Lillian Smith. She ran a girls' camp. Uh, she wrote and edited in the mountains of northeastern Georgia. Um, um, uh, she was uh, clearly but not openly in a long-term same-sex relationship. She chal challenged issues of, of, of gender. Um, um, most of what she wrote, she started by writing as lessons for teenage girls who came to the camp. Uh, she had more of a psychological focus on the issue of race and racism. Uh, she grew, grew up a Methodist, said in her book, Killers of the Dream, that white Southern Christians, quote, learned our lessons of segregation along with their lessons of brotherhood and democracy. Of uh, the three, we knew that segregation came first. In church, it came before brother, uh, in church it came before brotherhood, in schools it came before knowledge. And Lillian Smith is interesting in lots of ways. Uh, um, she fairly often reads like a 20th century race theorist uh, talking about privilege and psychology and the, the need for um, people defined as white to recognize um, um, uh, to, to deconstruct them, uh, their own privileges, and their own identities. Um, sometimes she sounds remarkably optimistic and kind of mid-1900s mid, uh, uh, optimism. Uh, she said in her book, 1955's book, Now is the Time, uh, said she hoped the world would soon be a world without racial segregation or without uh, the Iron Curtain. Uh, she said that founded on brotherhood, the world was moving toward a great family reunion. Um, in South Carolina, James McBride Dabbs, a Presbyterian theologian, a member of all sorts of activist organizations, um, speaker, writer, uh, he wrote something like 25 essays and two books with the word South in the title. Um, we study him in Southern Studies a lot because he, he says too many things are Southern, but that's, that, um, but uh, uh, one time a group asked him, uh, um, from Arkansas, asked him to come to speak to them on uh, Christian race relations, and he said, no, um, if you believe in Christian principles, you don't believe in the idea of race. So if without the idea of race, there's no idea of race relations. He said he would come to Arkansas and lecture on brotherhood, and, and that's, that's what he did. Um, Jason McBride Dabb says the clearest meanings of brotherhood to him are theological. Um, uh, he grew up in a time when uh, the clear the the specific activity for uh, churches was were to try to uh, uh, save save the souls of individuals. Um, uh, revival meetings, uh, hymns, sermons, lessons were d designed to uh, address the individual. James McBride Dabb said uh, the best thing that we can do is recognize salvation as a uh, a project that involves uh, our brothers and our sisters. He said that uh, uh, we need to in recognize the, the the failures and the sinfulness of human beings as a as a uh, group project. He said uh, this is what I know about brotherhood of uh, the brotherhood of mankind is the brotherhood of those who fail. Um, so who's trying to work out a theological meaning of of uh, of of brotherhood that was both social and um, and individual. James Lawson, Methodist minister. I think of my group, he's the only one still with us, still alive. He's deep into his 80s, still a minister. He's most famous as an activist writer um, uh, protesting uh, uh, from the perspective of Christian nonviolence. And it was very important to James Lawson to, uh, uh, to emphasize that nonviolence was not just a strategy, nonviolence is a, is a way of living and a way of communicating, um, and for him a way of, of addressing people as brothers and sisters. Um, he said, quote, we black and white Christians, and I hate saying that, that is uh, once more somebody who hated identifying people through categories of race, I hate saying that, have much to give each other. God is throwing us together, for he knows racism will be doing man, will be, excuse me, racism will be destroying mankind unless we live together as brothers and sisters. 
And like a lot of people I'm studying, James Lawson had the job of a preacher. So every fall he preached revival services. Um, or at the end of revival services, you're hoping that people will have life-changing experiences and announce themselves as Christian individuals and join churches. And he said that's it is extraordinary and wonderful that people are filled up with beauty and inspiration. And he would tell them beauty and fullness and inspiration uh, are exactly what you should have right, right now. Now, go serve your brothers. Now, go serve your sisters. Um, the uh, Will Campbell. How many ministers can I talk about? Not too many more. Uh, Will Campbell is the only person here that I've, that I've met. He's from Mississippi. Uh, he's uh, from southern Mississippi. Had a pretty fascinating life. Um, uh, he uh, was briefly a Baptist minister. He trained, started in, in at age 17. He became a Baptist minister. Uh, uh, he was fired for um, activism um, and uh, remained a Baptist minister without a church for the rest of his life. Um, he uh, is interesting in part because he hated institutions, um, hated churches. He said churches exist for themselves and they become bureaucracies. Um, he, uh, he, he, he disliked um, activist institutions, although he kept joining them. Uh, he, he was there when Martin Luther King Jr. helped form Southern Christian Leadership Conference in Atlanta, um, and he criticized that institution as, you know, another set of, you know, a bureaucracy that has its own, that starts to live for itself. Um, he was a leading minister in the National Churches, National Council of Churches, the group that, among other things, uh, helped train activists in the Mississippi Freedom Summer for 1964. Um, and once again, uh, well, in that group, actually, he said uh, he liked it because they didn't bother him and they didn't make him go to meetings. Um, um, I have colleagues like this, actually, in my, in my university who, um, who, who would be just fine as long as they didn't have to talk to other people. Um, but, uh, um, and Will Campbell, um, sorry, I, I don't want to, go on with too many details, uh, but one of the fascinating things about Campbell's life is that he lived most of his life as a visiting speaker, kind of cranky, kind of the challenger. People would vi invite him to events in which he would come and say, um, um, events, uh, race relations events. And he would come and say, I don't like institutions like the one that just invited me, and I don't believe in race relations, but let's go. And so, ha had, and, but let's, let's talk. What he talked about was um, that uh, um, he said that um, Christian people could not, should not believe in the concept of race. He said that uh, white churches had moved far too slowly, had moved more slowly than businesses, than political systems uh, on issues of race. Um, like Martin Luther King Jr., uh, who's a friend, um, uh, said that churches were, white churches were not leading through Christian thinking. He said that Christian theology, quote, doesn't make distinctions between um, people as Asians, Africans, Jews, Greeks, slaves, free, male, female, Black, white, old, young said, quote, for the Christian person to continue to place his brother and sister into classifications and categories is to deny the Christian faith that he claims. Uh, two more people. Thomas Merton, native of France. He spent his last 25 years as a Trappist monk in Kentucky. So we in Southern history claim him, um, thank, share him with uh, um, the... Uh, um, Thomas Merton wrote a great deal about autobiography and spirituality, the relationship between Christianity and other religions. He only started writing about the concept of brotherhood in the mid-1960s in relation to issues of, of race and in relation to his observations of the civil rights uh, movement. Uh, Thomas Merton lived in a monastery that did not have um, communication technology, uh, radio, television, uh, daily newspapers. Um, he received news about the civil rights movement through popular magazines, uh, read them two, three, four weeks after the events that they described, and then talked about them and talked about them theologically in uh, church uh, lessons to, to other monks um, in uh, um, northern Kentucky. Um, he was extraordinarily impressed by the 
self-discipline and willingness to sacrifice uh, that he saw among uh, African-American activists um, uh, in the civil rights movement by their commitment to nonviolence, by the acceptance of, um, of suffering. Um, said that uh, he saw in Catholic tradition, uh, saw examples of connections. Uh, he was especially concerned about um, he used brotherhood especially uh, as a concept um, to think about um, listening, uh, listening that white Americans need to listen to um, to black Americans uh, rather than the civil rights movement being a, an example of of giving rights as a gift. He said um, that too many white Americans were, uh, em quote, embracing our little black brothers to welcome them into white society. Uh, he said that, quote, um, brothers in the fullest sense of the word, uh, or um, uh, brotherhood in the fullest sense of the word, is a, a, a practice of, of equal listening, equal respect for, for dignity, um, uh, equal learning as well as, as teaching. Uh, he said, quote, a genuinely Catholic approach would mean brothers, like I said, in the fullest sense of the word. And then one more person I'd like to talk about because she is obscure. Uh, Sarah Patton Boyle uh, from Virginia, um, the University of Virginia. She had a, a family crisis that left her um, alone from her, her husband left her. Um, and uh, she had, and she turned from that family crisis to, uh, uh, to see what she could do as part of uh, an early civil rights movement in uh, Northern Virginia. Um, uh, she wrote an article that was full of optimism, articles called Southerners Are Readier for Integration Than You Think. Uh, the magazine published that article with a, its own title, you are going to like integration. Uh, she woke up very shortly after that to see crosses burning from the Ku Klux Klan on her front yard. So her optimism you know, faced a challenge from almost the first point that she became a public figure in, in, in activism. Um, she wrote a book called For Human Beings Only. Uh, um, talking, it was kind of an advice book about uh, how white and black Americans should talk to each other and said, let's stop talking about race and talk about ethnic groups. Uh, she has an essay called, uh, What is Brotherhood? And for her, brotherhood was constant work, constant learning, constant listening. Uh, she said that, yes, it could be frustrating uh, to be ostracized by one group and uh, not fully trusted by another. Uh, so she said what she wanted to be was, quote, a bulldog for brotherhood, somebody who would, who would, um, who would, who would push the process uh, uh, as she imagined the bulldogs, uh, um, kind of uh, unrelenting sort of approach. Um, the, uh, uh, my point with all these brief examples, these brotherhood and sisterhood um, short biographies, the point is that these individuals, different religious backgrounds, um, all of these are Christian, um, but of di from different groups, uh, some black, some white, many rejecting the concept of race, some in the middle of activism, some uh, um, on the side, some supporting from the sidelines. Uh, they all had something to say about this concept of brotherhood and sometimes brotherhood and sisterhood. Um, they all were experimenting with the concept. They were being, in their own ways, creative with the concept, uh, thinking that it mattered, thinking that it, it was a theology that had to do with um, racial, racial desegregation. Um, the fact that they came up with these terms, brothers in the fullest sense of the word, brothers for, bro for uh, bulldogs for brotherhood, uh, brotherhood of those who failed, brotherhood in a powder keg, uh, there are more, um, suggested that they were that it was a real concept and that they wanted to find their own ways to, uh, to use it. Um, and the, my, my last point from the, their perspective, or a last point, um, a lot of them said brotherhood was beautiful. It's, something, it's a concept that historians don't address very much. We address you know, <coughs> fairness, equality, uh, uh, issues of class. Uh, not aesthetics so much, but Martin Luther King Jr. talked about uh, this, a psalm of brotherhood, a, a, uh, a symphony of brotherhood. Uh, Patty Boyle uh, wouldn't stop. Um, uh, yes, she wanted freedom and justice for all, she said, but more. 
I want a new life. I want a life of serious joy. I want a life of genuine and continuing joy. Um, in general, these, I mean, to, um, I said they were all creative thinkers or crea- um, in their own ways. Um, they were trying to deconstruct the idea of race through religion. Um, we know of other ways uh, through science, uh, physical science, social science. Uh, we know of attempts to deconstruct race through class and shared economic interests and shared working interests. Um, their interest, their goal was racial deconstruction uh, through religion. Um, the, uh, so what happened? Pardon. I said before that it can be easy to criticize the concept as bland and unspecific, maybe not useful, maybe too Christian to deal with people who are not Christian, um, certainly too male. Um, it had critics in its day. Um, it had uh, um, uh, opponents from the left and the right. Uh, some of the loudest were opponents from the right. And as I mentioned before, um, part of why I found this topic worth writing about was when I found, I mean, it's possible to, to, to see the word brotherhood a lot and say, or brotherhood and sisterhood a lot and say, <sighs> bland rhetoric, I'll move on to think th- something more specific. But when I saw the opponents of the civil rights movement turning brotherhood into brotherhood-ism, uh, that's when I said, okay, it's an actual argument. Let's get in and study uh, that. I'll do that much more briefly. But the words of right-wing politicians and journalists and ministers um, uh, were full of denunciations of, of the concept of brotherhood. They used it, they denounced it as um, soft, optimistic, self-righteous, maybe hypocritical. Uh, they denounced it very much in the way that right-wing politicians denounced uh, political correctness uh, years later. And maybe today, I don't really live in the present, but maybe today uh, they denounced it in the way that right-wing politicians uh, denounced the word woke as a, you know, a kind of a, a popular movement uh, disconnected from um, from more, uh, possibly more serious issues. Um, the, uh, um, I don't really like quoting. I will only quote one uh, um, uh, white supremacist politician. Uh, the governor of the state where I live, Ross Barnett in 1960, said the average white American does not support se- desegregation despite all the phony brotherhoodism being talked about today. He went on to criticize brotherhoodism in um, television, in journalism, in uh, um, kind of national education magazines and movements. Um, the uh, more, much more specifically, in 1957, when uh, the um, the federal government supported the desegregation of uh, schools in Little Rock, Arkansas, and sent the military uh, to support that process. Um, uh, the um, conservatives um, called it Brotherhood by Bayonet and had a, a, a cartoon and even T-shirts of Brotherhood by Bayonet of U.S. military uh, with, uh, with bayonets supporting, uh, forcing uh, white and black uh, girls uh, to be in the same uh, school. The, uh, um, they use the term brotherhoodism a lot. As far as I can tell, that is a brand new term from the mid-1950s. I, I've, I've looked and have not found it anywhere else. Uh, it appears especially in uh, right-wing publications, um, the sort of publications that can be um, um, troubling uh, to spend much time with. More specifically, this is they made a couple of arguments, and I will speak for them without quote speak. I will. Sp- I will give their arguments without, uh, without quoting. They said this argument, one, brotherhood and sisterhood were about horizontal relationships, about tolerance and love and kindness and universal respect, and all of that may sound good, uh, they said, um, but they said if, we all are, if all we have are horizontal relationships, love and kindness and respect, if all we have are horizontal relationships, um, then we live without authority. Uh, we don't have... God setting rules. We don't have parents telling children uh, um, how they uh, should live. So they said that brotherhood and sisterhood ism was 
uh, encouraging life without standards, life without uh, moral standards. It was life that, that's just based on uh, getting along and being kind. Um, as part of a, a of a of a broader argument, the second argument, um, the uh, massive resistance figures, massive resistance, the the uh, general term for the opposition to the civil rights movement, especially on issues of schools, public schools. Um, massive resistance figures um, um, considered themselves to be um, considered themselves to be leading a movement for the rights of parents to determine the associates and futures of their children. Uh, and they said that uh, a parents' rights movement was fighting against a sibling to sibling movement, a brotherhood and so, brotherhood and sisterhood movement. So they said that you know if parents get to determine what their children should live like, should be with who they should be with, what they should aspire to, uh, what their futures should be, um, they said that brotherhood and sisterhood uh, thinking was uh, intruding into that, was getting in the way uh, of that, um, was undermining parenthood, the power of parents. Uh, by substituting social science or optimistic language or uh, different sets of leaders. Um, more broadly, um, a number of opponents of school desegregation um, um, said that school desegregation would lead to the end of the end of race uh, by allowing uh, white and black children to start associating with each other and uh, then uh, that would lead to uh, to dating and marriage and sex and children uh, and so a lot of them uh, in this parents rights movement were imagining that desegregation would would uh, would in its would in the same way that they were imagining the end of white supremacy uh, coming from their children or from their grandchildren and one more uh, um, particularly ugly argument, uh, a number of the massive resistance leaders said that uh, uh, that black families are particularly weak, uh, that there's too many uh, teenage um, single parents, too, too many single mothers. Um, they said that uh, they didn't want their white children associating with um, uh, with the results of the weakness of black family life, learning the lessons of, of black, f of kind of multiple definitions of family life. So it was one more attempt at asserting the, the power of ideas of parenthood, sometimes just fatherhood, um, uh, to reject the, uh, a movement that, that, that came with the theology of brotherhood and, and, and sisterhood. Um, that lasted a long time, that idea that brotherhood and sisterhood was uh, was speaking up for uh, that brotherhood and sisterhood worked against moral standards uh, that led toward anarchy or an amoral state. Um, and I would say that, and I argue in scholarship when I have much more time than I than you have any reason to listen to me to to talk tonight. Uh, that um, this idea about vertical relationships as opposed to horizontal relationships. Uh, saving the power of parents. Um, that's part of the background to family values thinking and religion, part of the family, uh, part of the, the background to the moral majority and the, the movement toward um, certain ideas of in, in uh, right-wing politics uh, that we see in the 1970s and ever since. Um, just a few minutes, just a couple of minutes, and then I'll be happy to 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 see what you think about all this topic and and either answer questions or or, or more productively I suspect uh, uh, listen to uh, suggestions and, and uh, potential objections um, um, in the mid 1960s late 1960s early 1970s brotherhood as a concept faced criticism from the left as well especially from uh, black activists who said their goals inv involved power and self-determination, not desegregation, not a symphony of brotherhood, but, uh, but authority. Uh, just two examples, maybe three. Uh, there's a famous document in 1966 uh, when the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee uh, decided it needed to be um, 
needed to be all black in leadership and membership with 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 white supporters but not members um, the student nonviolent coordinating committee said in that document that brotherhood was getting in the way of real issues of real communication uh, said quote one white person can come into a meeting of black people and change the complexion of the meeting that's a nice term is complexion change the complexion people would immediately start talking about brotherhood and love race would not be uh, discussed uh, they said that very few whites could understand anger or history uh, they were wanting action that it, they said that student nonviolent coordinating committee said that those whites were wanting to uh, assuage their own guilt or to feel superior to other whites not to uh, address issues of power in the black community at about the same time stokely carmichael in washington dc from Washington, D.C., who popularized the term uh, black power um, in my state of Mississippi. Uh, uh, Carmichael spelled out what brotherhood and sisterhood meant to him. He said brotherhood and sisterhood meant shared experiences of facing long histories of slavery, violence, segregation. By our black brothers and sisters, he meant the entire African diaspora with people identifying with and working with each other. Um, he said that black, quote, black power is a search for home, for something we can call our own. He said, the love we seek to encourage is within the black community, the only American community where men and women call each other brother and sister where we meet. And in fact, it was the, it was the 1960s when the terms brother and sister became synonymous with black man uh, and black woman. Uh, didn't appear until in dictionaries until the early 1970s, but dictionaries, you know, they take a few years. Um, more speculatively, I'll mention just very briefly, uh, 1964, some of you, I mean, you don't have to uh, follow, this is a suggestion, you don't have to uh, follow me on this, but um, many of you know um, the Sam Cooke song, Change Gonna Come, uh, born in born uh, within a little tent, just like the ri born near a river in a little tent, just like the river. I've been running ever since. Uh, there's a line, it's, uh, and I go to my brother, and I say, brother, help me, please. But he winds up knocking me back down to my knees. Maybe that's the brother as potential allies um, uh, that Carmichael was talking about and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee was talking about. Maybe not. Um, the, uh, as, as many of you are probably wondering, am I going to talk about the feminist movement in responses to a language that is almost entirely male? Um, the, uh, uh, in general, uh, the feminist movement in the South used, soror used sisterhood uh, to mean uh, specific common experiences facing legal discrimination, political discrimination, economic job discrimination, uh, violence and potential violence, or reproductive rights uh, issues, sexuality issues. Um, um, there was a New Orleans um, abortion referral services called Sisters Helping Sisters. There was a, a new um, lesbian religious camp called Camp Sister Spirit. Um, there was a lot of discussion of, of sisterhood in a, in a new movement in the 1970s uh, to, to make um, uh, rape kits available. Um, the, uh, they did not, as I've read, as I've seen, as I've researched, I did not find feminist groups attacking the concept of brotherhood in, in the ways that, uh, uh, for example, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee uh, document uh, did, um, but by talking about sisterhood as um, of groups of women with specific interests, uh, they made brotherhood irrelevant. Uh, brotherhood was not, uh, uh, not part of the language. Um, the uh, um, sisterhood was meaningful, useful, potentially uh, beautiful and powerful. Uh, um, in that setting, brotherhood was not this, this big unifying concept. Uh, to conclude, finally, and thank you for your patience, um, the, uh, um, I find when I have a microphone, I talk faster than I usually talk. I'm not sure why that is. I don't know if anybody else does that. Um, the... Uh, um, um, but I, I appreciate uh, your patience. Um, the question, uh, what good might brotherhood be? Um, I start to answer that. I'm just a historian. I talked earlier uh, that I'm just a historian. reminds me of Elvis Presley telling people, uh, 
just an entertainer, ma'am. I'm just an entertainer, uh, and uh, I don't really want to identify with Elvis Presley, but but uh, um, but that comparison comes to, uh, quickly. Uh, the answer uh, is uh, no, not really. Uh, there, I don't think there's. Uh, I'm not a spokesperson for the concept of of brotherhood. Um, I'm, I think it's fascinating. Uh, I think brotherhood is is too male, too gendered. It cannot be uh, overcome. Um, to be effective, uh, the idea of rejecting human categories um, uh, would be complicated in a in a world where we have so many so many people have worked so hard to to, to argue for uh, the rights and dignity and worth and of of all of their categories. Um, the uh, uh, it may just not be useful on a lot of topics. Um, and we talked about this in an earlier group. Uh, the term racial reconciliation may be a little closer uh, to what some of the goal people who talked about brotherhood, um, maybe the contemporary term. Um, words I hear that, that seem to line up with uh, brotherhood are things like um, civic strength, civic courage. Um, uh, if I can end tonight talking about strength and courage. I, I can't imagine a, a, a better place to end. So I thank you very much, and I'm happy to, uh, to hear what you uh, might want to ask or might want to say or might want to contribute on this topic. Thanks. Est-ce qu'il y a des questions, des commentaires, des réponses? Si vous souhaitez peut-être poser une question en français, on peut le traduire. <laughs> we did discuss other, earlier whether the concept of brotherhood lines up equally with lines up easily with the French concept of fraternité. I don't. I don't think it's the same thing. I, I think it's. Uh, uh, I think it, the brotherhood, the brotherhood and sisterhood has so much of a. Um, it's so much of a religious language that, that I, I'm, not, I'm not sure that, it's, that it has an immediate uh, um, um, a French parallel, but I'm happy to hear that that's right or wrong. In that sense, Ted, if I could. Ah, all right. An excellent question in the back. Um, so I have a quote in front of me uh, from the uh, Birmingham, Birmingham, sorry, Birmingham jail uh, letter of uh, Martin Luther King, uh, which is a narrow, narrow event social club with no meaning for the 20th century. Uh, so my question would be, um, was there more tension uh, that Martin Luther King felt from the church or from political entities? Motivation, f I, I may have missed the first part, motivation for? Uh, tension, was there more, uh, well, uh, Martin Luther King felt more tension uh, from the churches or from political institutions? Um, he had a fascinating life in relation to, uh, to different churches. He was a practicing minister for a good part of his life. Uh, there were, um, there were um, within, uh, the organizations of, of black Baptist churches. There were he had he faced opponents as well. Um, the uh, um, by the time he was in Birmingham, this would be the last, um, um, sadly, the last five years of his life. He was a uh, he was above all a a, a professional activist. Um, so he he was facing um, he was facing a great deal of opposition from state, local, and now we know national government, um, he, uh, uh, he, he was frustrated that uh, um, black and white churches weren't, weren't joining him, to, uh, weren't, weren't joining uh, in their own forms of activism, not that weren't joining him, but weren't joining in, in his own forms of activism. Uh, um, part of what's so effective about Letter from Birmingham Jail is that you know, it's so specific that he's got, he has five people who criticized him and he's criticizing and he's defending himself and, and criticizing their approach uh, in response. Um, and, and, and those five saw themselves as, you know, 
as the responsible, you know, the good guys, uh, the res- uh, the responsible people that were not on the right wing and were not supporting uh, uh, massive resistance. Um, but uh, uh, but I, I'd say he faced a lot more opposition from the state than from churches, and and uh, uh, he, um, like a number of the people I talked about. Um, He could be frustrated that other church people were not doing their own form of creative thinking. Let's say it that way. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, your historical views on uh, what happened. Uh, 40, 50, 60 years ago. Um, I'm interested to know what you think about the brotherhoodism that you referred to and how you think it might equate or not with the wokeism that people are talking about today. Um, I think it served the same purposes and I think it is actually a historical, it's historical background. I think the, um, that uh, kind of rhetorically it sounded well, about the same thing. Um, that is, rejections by people who believe that there was there should there need to be clear lines of authority. The parents should be able to tell their children um, um, how to live. That the media is getting in the way. The, the our, our kids today watch television uh, too much in the 1950s uh, and 60s. Our kids today are completely online in the in the 21st century, and the messages that they're hearing are all about humanism or e- e- egalitarianism um the uh um i, th- I, th- I think um the the i should mention again just a historian i don't really live in the present um i live <laughs> i live in past sources but um my impression is that the condemnation of wokeism uh, probably has a longer list of oppositions. C- a condemnation of brotherhoodism was about you know, the single issue of school desegregation and then the, the range of ways that its supporters thought um, school desegregation would, uh, would lead to moral collapse. Um, I think wokeism is, is a much, you know, is multifaceted, you know, um, with, you know, with lots more, lots more issues and lots more um, um, possible enemies, uh, yes, but but it's the same thing. But I'm happy to if happy to have your or other. Uh, it's the same tendency and approach. Uh, but 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 yes, sir. What? Well, I, it's hard to put a definition to wokeism today, right. and so too. When it seems to be a right wing uh, catchphrase that a lot of people are. Are using and I was aware of the brotherhoodism as a right-wing catchphrase at the time, but it, I also remember that for the black community, woke was was something that was very specific. People who were 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 in in that part of the community. When you're woke, you were aware of what was happening because the white people were going to do something to you, and you had to be awake enough to know what to do, and it seems to have morphed into something completely different as into this right-wing catchphrase that I still don't have a definition for. But I was hoping that you as a, as a, <laughs> as a historian might be able to shed some light on, on, on the historical point of view of woke in the 1960s. Um, as a historian, I, th- I think I may have done it all, all, all that I'm comfortable doing uh, by pointing out the, the, the lines um, that uh, from uh, brotherhoodism to political correctness, you know, which again multifaceted, um, uh, to uh, um, to uh, anti woke, the uh, um, the 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 criticism of people for being woke uh, certainly includes a kind of individual morality of of suggesting that uh, that either you are or not, and um, and and if you're not, that you're 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 still sleeping. So, uh, so thinking, you know, bro- 
broader than than the black community that that you were mentioning. I think the the critics of the concept, um, you know, don't like being called asleep. You know, and and uh, um, but I don't know that there is yet the scholar of wokeism, and it won't be me. So. Uh, yes, actually about being woke, as mentioned before, it meant uh, to stay on somebody to stay woke meant to tell someone that they should be aware of different social problems around them. And I think that it's the fact that very in the very recent years we've moved to a different meaning of the word is partly due to uh, the misuse and the bastardization of African-American vernacular English, which... Yeah. Uh, happen very fast online, which happens regularly, because uh, as I remember back in uh, when at the beginning of the Black Lives Matter movement in 2013, uh, I would very rarely see the word work being misused as it is now, and workism wasn't really a thing, and it was it's still meant to stay work, but it is something that has been spread online really quickly and has been misused mostly by people who don't speak AAVE. So I think that's how we, we ended up with this, with the right wing being made aware of the word and using it to mean anything that uh, can be mm. politically correct, but they don't agree with, for example, because there are a lot of things that also uh, are being described as work, but are just maybe fake situations that they are a straw man for the right to to blame uh, different issues on, on the left and on people who are more socially aware. So I think that's that's partly the reason why workism has developed. I, I, I think that's a better answer if to the gentleman's question than I gave, so thank you. Um, and uh, and if, if if you're ready to write that 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 work, um, um, good. The uh, um, uh, you know when people refer to start referring to something as something they don't like as ism, you know that's immediately a way of distancing themselves from the the from the uh, um, you know the the real meanings. Um, the uh, uh, I. I um, Real, I mean, not real meetings. The 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 previous uses of the meetings, but uh, um, the uh, I think al along with ism, but also today. So I mean, the, the right wing uses the word woke in quotation marks, um, just the way that the critics of brotherhood use the word brotherhood in, in quotation marks as a way of distancing themselves immediately. But uh, no, I I will look forward to you know. To the thoughtful scholarship that may be already there, or that needs to be there, there's there quickly about this, you know, the, the multi-step process that you're describing. So, thank you. Um, do you think that despite all the brotherhood, there is still as much racism in America or in the United States as, as there once was? Um. Um. This is a, a rare moment where where. Elvis is attractive um, to me, but uh, um, the uh, the the very straightforward historian's answer is that um, a lot of that racism has changed its language, um, and so instead of uh, outright discussions of superiority and inferiority uh, of uh, um, Clear disparaging comments. Um, um, a lot of of people practicing their form, a form of white supremacy, um, mask that in, in language. They talk about um, um, law and order above all. Uh, um, um, but uh, uh, I, I think also um, a lot of the forms of white supremacy now um, are not exclusively. Um, Anti-black, there's so much uh, um, anti-immigrant on the on the, uh, especially on the, um, uh, on the issues of, of Latin Amer Latino immigration, and uh, um, so that uh, there are different types. Um, how to put it together and say, um, 
uh, things are better, things are worse. Um, uh, I, I want to be hopeful and say there are clear signs that some things are um, some forms of insult and humiliation are harder <laughs> and uh, um, 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 but I, but beyond that uh, I don't really want to so if, I mean I, I've uh, but beyond beyond that I, I don't have a comfortable way to answer that but uh, um, but uh, um, thank you for thank you for a question that, that I will that I, I, I stumble through I appreciate it but, uh, I can in the back row <laughs> Um, uh, you might have mentioned it earlier. I'm sorry if you did. I couldn't get here on time. Um, did any black artists or non-religious uh, people in general participate in the Brotherhood movement, or was it something that was necessarily necessarily linked to Christianity? No, that's a great question. It, it, it may be that I, I so frequently looked at religious sources that I didn't find. Um, I didn't find other uses of the term in, in secular language. Um, I found a lot of examples of of groups that had been that had not used religious language, not used brotherhood and sisterhood before, starting to use them in the late 1940s and 1950s. Um, the NAACP I mentioned. Um, I like to study this group of of social scientists at the University of North Carolina. Uh, almost all of them white. Um, uh, activist in all sorts of ways of, of uh, anti-violence, um, anti-poverty, pro-labor union, anti-lynching. Um, and in the 1930s, they're full of statistics and full of, of social science theories. Um, their journal suddenly in the 1950s just reads like a bunch of, of sermons. Um, and uh, Brotherhood and Sisterhood are, are, are there a, a great deal in the Social Forces magazine. Um, I suspect there are uh, is the easy answer. Um, that probably was, that, that's my mistake for that because of the limits of who I was studying. That's also I recognize that's a very safe answer, probably. But I didn't study them is not the sharpest uh, response to any question. Thanks. Uh, thank you for your uh, for sharing um, what you said today. Um, so maybe my question kind of uh, bounces back from uh, the one just asked. Um, do you think that um, so, like you said, brother brotherhood maybe was um, a notion brought brought up to disconstruct to di disconstruct um, disregregate disegregation uh, through religion? Um, because I assume that that a lot of um, well, racial theories also were born from um, from uh, religious, um, let's say, arguments. Or uh, mm -hmm. uh, so, do you think that brotherhoodism, or well, just brotherhood, was just uh, spe spe like specifically targeted to um, to speak more to a, a religious to religious people, and that it didn't resonate as much in uh, other circles? I don't know if my question is really clear. I, I hope it's. I, I'll answer what I think is your question, and if I, if I miss it, apologies. Um, the uh, um, a lot of the religious activists who use the term brotherhood uh, were responding uh, to histories of conservative uses of religion. Um, for a lot of them, it was conservative uses of religion that talked about um, hierarchy. Um, uh, for a lot of them, it was conservative uses of religion that said that religion should be non-political. Um, that they, they called it the uh, the spirituality of the church in some some denominations. And so, talking about brotherhood, as the couple of the people that I mentioned uh, was for them, th their way of saying we're not giving up on salvation and conversion as part of what Christianity does. Uh, we're trying to make it more of an active uh, process. Um, for a long time, that was one of the 
divisions in American Protestantism was the, um, politically active Protestantism and politically not active, uh, where Protestantism that is geared toward um, adding new members to the church and staying out of issues uh, with the occasional exception of prohibition, uh, uh, for example. Um, um, so the people that I talked about, including Martin Luther King Jr., uh, yeah, came, from a, came from a tradition where they could easily see uh, one or both of those forms of conservatism and they were trying to uh, reject that. Um, uh, how many of them, I'd have to pause and consider, how many of them and in what ways were they trying to release, trying to um, influence people or reach people uh, outside of, of a religious setting is a, is a harder question. Uh, and we've, I've talked and other, lots of scholars have talked better than I can that did this, did this really specifically Christian language that, that, uh, that these individuals used, um, could they use it to people, to, to, uh, to address people outside who weren't Christian? They thought that the best Christianity that they knew was universalizable and welcoming to all people, um, but were those people part of the same language and, and, and ready to listen in the same way is, a, is, a, is another question. I think the answer to that is pretty obviously it's, it's going to be hard. Um, but uh, um, there were also moments, and sorry I, I, to rattle on, there, there were certainly moments when some of the, um, on the other hand, when some of the um, less religiously, some of the activists who are less likely to use religious language um, really appreciated the attention and inspiration. Um, the um, NAACP was, you know, like I said, this legal organization. Um, and uh, suddenly in the late 1940s, there's a spike in their membership um, uh, for from different and spike in their significance for for different reasons but uh, um, but they appreciated it when they were you know whether you call it people attracting uh, other people through public relations or or just people kind of elevating the stakes um, uh, so it was a, a, a positive thing, but my, my first point is, I think, is more specific to your question. Is probably uh, more important that these were uh, Christians who believed that their Christianity uh, could speak to all people in the world, uh, without possibly with Thomas Merton as the example, without a lot of work on thinking about how all those people in the world uh, um, were hearing or using that language. Thank you. Um, do you think the importance of brotherhood has decreased throughout the years? Yes. We're not supposed to answer questions, yes or no. Uh, uh, academics are, 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 are never get to do that. Yes, it has. Um, I think in part because of the gender. Uh, the, I mean, it's just a gendered term. It's a, um, um, and uh, uh, as much as people used it thinking that it meant all of all human beings that it's still a gender term um, the uh, and I, I was intrigued occasionally to see people using sisterhood and brotherhood because it was a very intentional effort to to make the point that it shouldn't be a gender term but it is a gender term um, but uh, um, more broadly it just has its it just has its limits and also there are lots of there are lots of human problems where the concept of brotherhood just doesn't help. Um, maybe it does, or it, do, it hasn't helped at least. Um, so I think it's, um, to me as a historian, let's talk about it because it doesn't seem immediately relevant. That's part of what we do. Hey, look, this was important. Um, but, uh, but I think the, 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 the question, uh, where is it now, brotherhood primarily means today uh, what it had before, that is, men's groups with specific interests. Uh, thank you. It's part of what academics are supposed to do is say, oh, it's far more complex. But no, it's not far more complex. Thank you, Ted. Merci beaucoup. Merci pour cet uh, échange uh, extrêmement uh, riche. Et pour, uh, Ted, thank you again for, for, for an excellent conference, uh, rich and uh, uh, full of lessons. And so, again, thank you very much. Uh,
Uh, we hope to see you again Thursday night or at the end of the month for other activities here at the Institute. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Merci. Thank you very much.